Good morning and welcome to, to the Doctor's Inn. I'm Marsha Boyles and as usual I'm delighted to be introducing our primary primary speaker on this show, uh, Dr. Kamal Seth Sethi. Dr. Sethi is one of the one of the primary care providers at the Medical Center. Dr. Sethi, this morning I think we have a topic that's particularly relevant and interesting. We're talking about antibiotics, friend or foe. What would you, how would you like to begin that discussion? So we're going to, I thought it might be helpful to start off our discussion by introducing a couple of words which are relatively new and they're actually pretty new and I'll tell you why so. So the first one is antibiotic stewardship. 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 And you know, mm -hmm. we talk about we have to be stewards um, of the planet. Of the planet. We mm -hmm. have to be stewards of the planet. Mm -hmm. In a microcosm, we have to be stewards for antibiotics. Now, when we think of stewardship, we generally tend to think that stewardship is performed by a group of people who think a certain way. But what I'm about to tell you um, about antibiotic stewardship is that this is a combined effort between healthcare providers and patients. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Uh -huh. um, and truly, antibiotic stewardship is critical if we are going to be attentive to how we treat infections. You notice I didn't say treating infections, but I said how we treat infections, how we assess and treat infections. Mm -hmm. And we'll see as we talk how they are our allies. We use them for good purpose, but they can also be our foes because they can be associated with a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So this may sound like the dictionary club, and I could have very well belonged to one when I was a kid because I loved new words and to know what they mean, um, is microbiome. And so if the word microbiome seems new, it's probably right because it didn't even begin to be used in medical vocabulary until about 2008. So it's pretty new. So what does microbiome mean and what is its relevance to antibiotic stewardship? So if antibiotics are used to treat infections, principally bacterial infections, the microbiome is all of the microbes, not necessarily bacteria, but all of the microbes that live on us human beings. Let's, let's define microbe. So microbe means micro, anything that you can see under the microscope, microscope. but you can't see, mm -hmm. you know, with the, without a microscope. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and it comprises bacteria, it comprises um, viruses, mm -hmm. which as you know, we are teeming with viruses mm -hmm. in the universe, and we as individuals, each individual person, mm -hmm. um, fungi and mm -hmm. protozoa. All right, so these are single cell primarily? That's correct, mm -hmm. that's correct. So um, we're going to talk about the microbiome, and I think some of the facts about it are so interesting. And I have to tell you that even though we think of microbes as being associated with infection, they're much more than that. Okay. I attended the American Society of Nephrology this past week and ending uh, now. And even within specialized areas of the body, we are talking about the microbiome and its role in ah. health. So maybe then we should just back up and go to our first issue, which is the antibiotic stewardship. And then we'll come to the microbiome and discuss okay. that some more. So, you know, last time uh, we spoke about infection prevention. And the best way to prevent infections, which would obviate the need for antibiotics or anti-infectives, would be to prevent infections. And even though this sounds um, uh, repetitious, uh, nonetheless, it's important to talk about hand washing. Mm -hmm. And I want to put in a plug for hand washing after using the bathroom. We can't mm -hmm. say it often enough, and appropriate hand washing, which according to the CDC means 20 seconds. And if I show you my bare hands, I'll tell you the parts of the hand that don't get washed properly are these areas right here. Mm -hmm. So you put some soap and you go like this. Mm -hmm. But these areas don't get 
washed properly. So to be particularly attentive, because that's how infections get introduced into the body. We used to have so many more infections before we knew antiseptic techniques and before we started wearing gloves. Just mm -hmm. imagine that. Mm -hmm. So preventing infections is a very, very important part. And anybody that's particularly interested in that topic could go back to our last program. That's correct. Um, which is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's correct. So antibiotics are our friends when we use them to either treat infections and in limited circumstances to prevent infections. So, you know, we talked about the common infections last time and we're going to talk um, with regard to antibiotics about bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. we we use antibiotics to treat bacterial infections, and there are many non-bacterial infections. So the common bacterial infections for which we use antibiotics are well known to everybody. I'm sorry to say many have suffered from them, mm -hmm. and they include urinary tract infections, bacterial pneumonias, and skin infections. Mm -hmm. And so at some point or another, um, either you yourself or someone you know has had such an infection. Mm -hmm. And you know that when we use antibiotics, the response can be really quite remarkable in mm -hmm. terms of getting the individual better. Now, sometimes we have to use them to prevent infections. So based on um, CDC guidelines and quality criteria um, that are used, quality metrics that are used to judge um, success of surgery, hospital associated infections called HAIs is that when you're doing any surgery that you use prophylactic antibiotics mm -hmm. but they're for a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. The defined period of time is a dose preoperatively for 24 hours and then they're automatically stopped. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it prevents infection chiefly from the skin from getting into the body uh -huh. Mm -hmm. and affecting um, those mm -hmm. type of surgeries and mm -hmm. they can include you know uh, cardiac surgery certainly heart valve replacement surgery and um, uh, joint replacement surgeries mm -hmm. but for a finite period of time we're not talking about giving antibiotics for seven days we're talking about three doses and sometimes depending oh. on the antibiotic a single mm -hmm. dose and then that's it mm -hmm. so when we use antibiotics to treat infections, the goal should be to use it for the shortest time possible. So every infection doesn't need seven days of treatment, it doesn't need five days, mm -hmm. doesn't need three days, sometimes a single dose may suffice. Uh -huh. So for instance, if there is an ordinary bladder infection, one big dose of an antibiotic given just once may be sufficient. Um, now, it's important to say that many infections that we see are non-bacterial. And the reason I bring this up is because we're going to talk about the recommendations that how you can become a steward for antibiotic therapy that's given to you. You can be an informed consumer, just like you know, using safe products, how to use antibiotics safely. So the other non-bacterial infections that of course we see a lot, and these are particularly relevant, are the viral infections. Most of the mm -hmm. upper respiratory infections are non-bacterial. Common cold. Common cold, mm -hmm. throat infections, a lot of these, even pneumonias, they're viral. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics will not work. Mm -hmm. And so many times we go in thinking, well, you know, I had pneumonia some years ago, and if I don't take care of this, this will go to pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. It depends on what was causing the problem. Right. And so an assessment is required to determine if or not it is bacterial. Certainly, we may choose an anti-infective. So for instance, if somebody has shingles, we know that we can use an antiviral agent which will reduce um, the severity of the infection. Uh -huh. It will not make it go away, but it mm -hmm. will reduce the severity. So, What about the flu? Is that a virus? It is a virus. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as you know, we have the flu vaccine, yes. which is preventive. And the Tamiflu. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. it is. That's, that's mm -hmm. preventive. Mm -hmm. But is there any value to giving Tamiflu after the fact? No. But many times it is given. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I mean, once it has occurred, most people will give it. And you know, this is the thing we have to remember about the practice of medicine. It is not 
um, a complete science. It is both a science and an art. Mm -hmm. Because unlike pure science, where you have a definite diagnosis every single time, the task of the clinician is much bigger than that because you have to make an assessment of that person and you don't have a culture to support it, let's say for the cold. We wouldn't even bother doing a culture. That's a judgment we make every right. day, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you would never know. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of antibiotic stewardship is also very new. It was, we didn't even think much about overutilization of antibiotics mm -hmm. until 1999. And this became a question because we were seeing a lot of uh, infections which would not respond to antibiotics and the development of mm -hmm. resistance. So I'm sure everybody knows about the superbug, the flesh-eating bacteria, yes. right? So that's MRSA. I mean, we've all heard of it. So, you know, this can attack the skin and it can actually cause tissue to be destroyed. It can result in loss of limb. We hope it never gets to that point. But if it does happen, we know how highly infectious it is. Is it resistant to? It can. Well, the name says methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Ah. So this organism is all around us. But if we don't utilize our antibiotics correctly, these bacteria will evolve resistance and they'll become resistant mm -hmm. to methicillin, which is the most potent drug that used to be available to us. Mm -hmm. So MRSA implies it's methicillin resistant. Mm -hmm. So overutilization of antibiotics is very important. Mm -hmm. The word antibiotic stewardship really arrived on its own around 2010, 2011, so it's very new. Mm -hmm. yes. So we really have to be stewards of antibiotics and not overuse them. Mm -hmm. um, I want to sort of illustrate this with um, regard to urinary tract infections um, in particular. We have to remember to differentiate infection and inflammation. Every symptom that seems like infection may not necessarily be so. And it is the task of the healthcare provider to determine if it is inflammation or if it is infection. So keeping that in mind, the CDC developed uh, what I think is a very nice uh, page that I have brought with me and which you can serve uh, for yourself if you want. But I thought it would be helpful to speak about it. Mm -hmm. So now this is about you. The physicians many times, as you know, when you go, are reluctant to prescribe an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes in and says, oh, I have this nasty cold um, and I have to have an antibiotic. That's the opening salvo mm -hmm. from the resident. Are you still hearing a lot of that? Quite a bit, mm -hmm. especially with urinary tract infections. Sometimes we'll get calls on weekends. I have a urinary tract infection and I need an antibiotic mm -hmm. now. So the problem is this, you have to take a step back and be the informed person you should be. And these are questions that you should ask your healthcare provider if they are going to give you an antibiotic. You should ask first question, I'm going to read it to you. Could any symptoms be caused by something other than bacteria or something that is not an infection? So if it is a cold, it's a viral infection, mm -hmm then antibiotic is not going to work, mm -hmm. right? What signs or symptoms should I look for that could mean that I might need an antibiotic? So, you know, if you give me your upper respiratory symptoms and I start asking you some more questions, you know, have you had fever, have you had chills? Mm -hmm. can, those can occur with viral infections as well. But by all means ask, what is it that is causing you to think that this is a bacterial infection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the third fact, question is, can I be monitored to see if there are any other non-antibiotic therapies that can be used? So for mm -hmm. instance, you have a sore throat, right? So we've checked, it's not strep throat. So most likely it's not bacterial. Mm -hmm. So can you gargle your throat? Uh, salt gargles or Listerine gargles? Can you use lozenges? The answer is yes. Does it mean just because you have a sore throat that you need an antibiotic? No, it does not mean that. So these are three questions. I wish we could font these so that you could look at these and they would be there to look at. But those are three questions that you should ask. Mm -hmm. Now let's reverse it. Now you're quizzing the provider. 
I say to you, mm -hmm. oh, so you've been coughing and I don't tell you much else. And sometimes, you know, we physicians are very cryptic. We speak in very short we sentences. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have a cough, okay, I'm gonna give you an antibiotic. So you said, well, wait a minute. So CDC suggests these are four questions to ask your healthcare provider when you are prescribed an antibiotic. If the physician doesn't tell you that first. Okay. First question is, what antibiotic, what infection is the antibiotic treating? Mm -hmm. Reasonable question, right? Mm -hmm. Next question, what side effects might occur? Mm -hmm. I mean, we give antibiotics so freely, we do need to talk about side effects. Third question is, could any of my other medications interact with this antibiotic? Mm -hmm. So physicians may not be as knowledgeable about interactions, mm -hmm. although our um, um, electronic records allow those interactions to pop up immediately. And then the clinical pharmacist will know if there is an interaction because you may have a medicine that's ah. been given to you by another provider that we may be unaware of. Okay. So amongst the drugs that you have to be very careful with is if you take comidine or warfarin, uh, which is a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. But the clinical pharmacist will jump on this right away and say, hey, wait, there's an interaction. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the fourth question is, how will I be monitored to know that my illness is responding to the antibiotic? And this is where, you know, everybody knows they're getting better right. or they're getting worse. So you can, if you didn't start off with a bacterial infection, you can get a superimposed bacterial infection. And that's why question number four, how will I know if I'm getting better? And we usually say, well, if you're not better, please come back and see us. And so that's for us to then assess, is it running its natural course and it's just being slow? Or is there a super added bacterial mm -hmm. infection which should be treated? Mm -hmm. So antibiotic stewardship today does not sit with the healthcare providers alone. It sits with the community at large because mm -hmm. you must question it. And if you know of someone, have a family member, a friend who is in continuing care, even more relevant. Because also a family member will say, well, mom doesn't look the same. And I think she has a urine infection and I want her to have an antibiotic. That is the wrong approach. We must first look and determine if there is an infection before we give the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Because we do know that there are a lot of side effects and we see them all the time. Mm -hmm. So antibiotic stewardship is really a collaborative effort between healthcare providers and the residents who are the informed consumers mm -hmm. after today, or more so after mm -hmm. today, we should say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is a natural lead in then to this microbiome. It's a word that you're gonna hear a great deal about. Mm -hmm. Just so, beginning to, to hear it a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this word was, as I said earlier, um, was not even recognized until the late 1990s and really came into its own um, when the NIH decided to sponsor research around it called the Human Microbiome Project. Ah. So now let us take a step back and talk about what are these, what is the microbiome. First, so first let's talk about the microbes. The microbes, as we said, are all the bacteria, the viruses, the common ones, and the fungi that exist mm -hmm. on our bodies. These are all over us. We are actually a walking microbe. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. So how many microbes do you think there are on the human body? I'm not good with, you know, when somebody talks about a billion or a trillion right. dollars and we talk about a budget deficit, I'm trying to think the number of zeros right. at the end. So it's beyond guessing, okay? Because there are more than a hundred trillion microbes on our persons, on each person. Really? Yes. All together, all together, these microbes weigh five pounds. And you'd never think of it in that Good way. Heavens, that's yes. an astonishing figure. It is, it is. So we all know there is a human genome, right? Yes. 
So we know that there are X number of genes on, on the human genome because that's been mapped. Right. And so the um, microbiome project is still being worked on. Our knowledge about it is still evolving. It's being studied. But what we do know is that what we call microbiome represents the genes of all of these microbes. So if you take all of the microbes that inhabit us, that oh. colonize our bodies, uh -huh. all of the genetic material together contribute constitutes what is called the microbiome. Okay. So you've got the human genome, mm -hmm. and then you've got the microbe genome collectively, which is called the microbiome. Mm -hmm. the and mi that's the DNA of all those all single of, cells. All the yes, the genes within all of those cells. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That weigh five pounds. Yes. That's and these, in quantitatively, are 200 times more than the number of genes in human beings. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine who rules us. So sometimes, you know, this They're not as intelligent. Well, you know, sometimes we, th we, we think of bacteria in the minds of most people. Bacteria are harmful. So these bacteria are actually mm -hmm. just colonizers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the maximum number of these bacteria sit in the gut and mostly in the colon, mm -hmm. some in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. These are followed not in any specific order by the skin, the mouth, the nose, and the vagina. Mm -hmm. So if we just think of it, if we had to put our money somewhere, we already know that the gut plays a very big role. Mm -hmm. And when we give antibiotics, what is one of the common symptoms that people get? In addition to skin rashes, they get stomach upset. Stomach upset yeah. Why do they get a stomach upset? It's because we are changing the microbes which are in the gut. So the majority of these microbes which form part of the microbiome are good bacteria. And they have a very important function. Now, we may have always thought of them as, you know, hand washing is about getting rid of the germs. It is. Mm -hmm. But the microbiome is much more than that. So the vast majority of these are good colonizers, good bacteria. And they have important functions to play in maintaining health, mm -hmm. in nutrition, mm -hmm. and in uh, preventing infections, mm -hmm. in uh, helping our immune system. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. So um, let's talk about uh, how do they help us to maintain nutrition. They produce enzymes which help us to digest food. All right. Now we're talking strictly about the gut. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. We're talking. Well, mm -hmm. we'll talk about others, but chiefly about the gut because that's the one that's that we know the most about. Okay. Okay. Um, they produce uh, the B vitamins, including vitamin B12, okay? Um, thiamine, riboflavin, and vitamin B12. And then they produce another very important vitamin, which is vitamin K, which, as you know, we need for coagulation. Mm -hmm. And they also regulate our immune system, okay? So um, when we think about these and we say, well, um, you know, they're helping us digest food and maintaining nutrition, what evidence do we have for that? So we know that all of the food that we eat takes simple sugars, you know, table sugar mm -hmm. used in beverages. Um, if you, those are very easily absorbed in the small intestine, but it's the complex sugars, the complex carbohydrates that actually go to the colon and are, are actually metabolized there by the bacteria which produce the enzymes to break down those complex carbohydrates. So as a practical example, because otherwise this seems abstract, in studies looking at twins, lean and obese twins, okay? Um, lean twins break down the food slowly and have a diverse group of bacteria in their colons as compared to obese twins who have a less diverse group of bacteria and break down the food very fast because they have more enzymes. And really? because, because they break down the food 
food so fast, they absorb it quickly and are more likely to remain obese. Isn't that fascinating? Dr. Sethi, that is amazing. I mean, I think So it's we could blame our extra weight on our... <laughs> That, so because, that is truly amazing. Yeah, so because we don't have much time, I will just say in diseases like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. and some other autoimmune disorders, it is thought experimentally that the microbiome may have a role to play. Now, how can we change the microbiome? Can we change it? And I'll leave you with some things to think about uh, moving forward. Yes, you can. We've all heard a lot about probiotics, unregulated industry. It's worth $35 billion. And in 2025, it's expected to be double in scope. Do those probiotics really work? We have no idea. We know the ones that do work are those that have the active life cultures. And natural foods are better than supplements. So the foods that stand out in that regard then are the yogurts with your life cultures, fermented foods, mm -hmm. pickled foods. So you might have heard about uh, drinks that we never knew about before, kefir, kombucha. My son was at um, uh, TED in Vancouver last year and he said the only drink that people were drinking was kombucha. Is that right? Yes, yes. Filled with all these good bacteria, uh -huh. okay? So there's another word I want to leave you with before our time is up, is prebiotic. Prebiotics. Pre, as opposed to probiotic. Right. Prebiotics are foods. Prebiotics are foods that improve healthy bacteria by releasing substances called short-chain fatty acids. So sometimes these are given to people who get C. diff. Some people may have heard of C. diff. If yes. you take antibiotics for a long time, that's the overgrowth of these bad bacteria that mm -hmm. can even be fatal, but can be very troublesome. Mm -hmm. So the prebiotics are foods which are high in fiber. Okay? So remember to eat your dandelion green salad. Remember to eat bananas. Asparagus and hot from the American Society of Nephrology, broccoli. Of all the oxidative foods that give you that give you antioxidants, broccoli is at the top of the list. All your highly colored fruits and vegetables are your true prebiotics and the best ones to go for. Okay. You need to talk to the dietitians at Greenspring <laughs> about about, I don't think I've ever had a dandelion green here. Well, I might leave that to the resident council to take up with them, and go. I'll be happy to, uh, to add my, I, I'll be happy to uh, offer any information that I can take. Well, Dr. Sethi, this has really been very interesting um, and, and informative and helpful. Um, I would like to see us do a program continuing this topic at some point. I think this is, you know, extremely important and relevant. And it's cutting edge. I mean, Very uncommonly so. have we lived in a time in medicine where patients and healthcare providers can jointly work towards improving health to this degree. Yeah. You know, and so the yeah. more informed you are, the better off we are. Oh, absolutely. Eat the right foods and question your doctor. All right. Well, those are two very good pieces of advice. Mm -hmm.